So, good morning, everyone. Um, it seems that your chairs today don't have a mic, so that could be that will be an interesting thing to to handle. So, we'll need to do with our with one mic, or maybe steal one of the mics over there. Yes, thanks. So um, we'll get started just in a minute, and uh, by the time we, are, we get started, I would just like you to show you how you are going to be able to f where you are able to find all the the meeting materials for today. So if you go to the IETF uh, website, uh, there you have uh, for our meeting today you have the meeting materials for our IETF meeting for the IETF one hundred. And when it loads, so here you have you know all the, the working groups, and uh, if you scroll down into to, to the int area, and you have all the different working groups that are in the int area, you have LPN, and here you have the materials. So you can see you know that we'll start with the first presentation that is the introduction A, and then we move on down with the other. Uh, with, the, with the other uh, presentations. So if you click here, you go directly and you have the, the, the PDF file that is the, uh, that is the source of this presentation. So uh, normally uh, we like going every time and you know opening each of and every of the presentations through through here and uh, but as you see there is a little bit of a, uh, of a delay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to use the files that we already have on our computer. But it's exactly the same material. So uh, I think that uh, with this thing, uh, we are ready to get started. It's uh, 9.32. And so hello, everyone. Welcome to the. Uh, to this session. So this is the LPN working group. Uh, and as any ITF uh, meeting, as any ITF working group, so this is, a, you should of course read the note well. Uh, if you have not done so, of course, uh, here you have just the main points, but please do go and read uh, the document. So basically, what uh, everything that you say here, everything that you write in the Jabber room, everything that you write in the chat uh, is considered as an IETF co uh, contribution. And uh, in case you are aware of any IPR on it, uh, you should come and, and tend to tell, tell to, to the chairs. Uh, as a reminder, this, uh, as, as we said, so minutes are taken, the, 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 the meeting is recorded and your presence is locked. So, uh, we would like to ask you to go and to contribute to the uh, to the collaborative meeting uh, tool, which is the uh, with the Etherpad. You have the link just here uh, on, on 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 the screen. So etherpad.tools.itf.org, and so you can find this also on the uh, on the link of the of the da the data tracker of the working group. So here you have all the information for this. And uh, the first thing that we would like to see is uh, the volunteers for, for the minute takers. So, Dominic, thank you. We need another. Uh, Raoul is, uh, is here. And uh, <laughs> that's good. And uh, Julien, I think he, I saw him yesterday. He will be coming later. We have at least two for the moment, and tomorrow we're coming. Uh, also, so for the remote participations, you have the Meet Echo link that is uh, that is there. So just uh, we have already a couple of dozen uh, visitors here, so that's uh, that's good. And we also have a Jabber. Uh, so um, for Jabber Scribe volunteers. Jabber, Jabber. Okay, so Rahul will also do Jabber. Thank you very much, Rahul. So as a, as a reminder, you know, the things that are happening on Jabber, uh, Rahul can go and, and, and say to the mic in, in case you have questions or things like this. So uh, the mailing this is LP-1, and uh, the meeting materials are uh, at, at, at the following link. We already saw that the way they are 
the way we, you can find them. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, so we start with uh, the agenda bashing and then we have a pretty dense schedule uh, planning with uh, the LPN overview document. Then uh, you know, we start with the working group items that are right now. And uh, we move on to uh, the ICMP and the new uh, drafts that are coming up to this. Uh, so um, one of the points is that uh, we would uh, like to talk a little bit more uh, on the rechartering, on the rechartering process and the rechartering items here. So probably we'll take a little bit more than 20 minutes in the first slot. And uh, this is so we, we we allow ourselves to to you know to do this, and at the end the, the we'll see the time that is remaining. Maybe we'll cut down on the last presentation. Do you have any other modifications or any other suggestions that you would like to add to this uh, to the agenda? Yes, I'm Juan Carlos Oniga. Uh, are we planning to discuss about the rechartering uh, part? That's that was released. That was, sorry, with the mics. It's, that's what we we said. It's going to like the first twenty minutes are basically going to turn to thirty or or thirty five minutes because we are going to be discussing the recharging items during this first slot. So you, you will update those times then, or we, we, or we push. I mean, we don't know exactly how long that could take, but we expect to be pushing the whole agenda a little bit. Instead, what we would discussed yesterday that we could do that at the end, and we thought no, let's just put that early in the meeting. Then let's push the rest of the event. Okay. Sure we okay. Uh, last time we had a list of items that we had uh, already started discussing. Uh, uh, I think Anna was presenting, right? Yes, we have a slide on that. Okay, great. Uh, Thanks. Maybe we can, we can come back to the line once we have that slide on Okay, so with this, um, this is the agenda bashing. Uh, Pascal, maybe if you want to, you can. Uh, Go on with the, the status of the, the charter items. Yep. So I'm going to change it. Okay. So um, we, we we started with a very aggressive uh, charter. I mean, the charter was mostly to, to create what we call ship now and, and uh, another view. And so here is basically the, the latest status of the uh, IT page about uh, our work group activity. So you see that we have actually achieved. Uh, one new uh, milestone in our charter. We have submitted the FT1 overview uh, to the ISG for publication uh, as an uh, informational document. And the next uh, milestone is for, uh, actually, it's delay, but it's, uh, we still hope we can win this year, is to send the ship document to the uh, ISG. So we, we are a few months late. And that's actually explained not by the compression, but by the fragmentation, which is uh, quite difficult to achieve uh, efficiently without uh, too many round trips. In particular, at the end of Windows, and things like that, there are corner cases. And we'll discuss that later in the working group, but we'll, we'll probably have a special review coming this ATF on the corner cases of the fragmentation time. So the, the fragmentation has delayed us a bit. But uh, the document will see that it's very right and uh, soon enough, so I expect that we'll be able to uh, ship it. And, and then we have the quad, which is not to the same maturity level yet, and has to be has to go through uh, So, Dr. Krishnan, so I just got the uh, you know the LP runs back uh, last week uh, for PubRec, so I'm waiting on the indirectorate and the IoT directorate reviews on it. And I hope, like, I can start the ITF last call on it by the end of the year. So, like, uh, let's say, like, the review is coming about by the beginning of December. So I'll go do my AD eval as well at the same time. So hopefully, by end of the year, we should have an ITF last call on this. Okay. Yes, and I've seen that Samita has already sent a request to the IoT directorate looking for reviews. So that's, that's moving on. Yeah. So, so just a um, uh, question because on the jabber there was a question that the chair's mic is off. 
there is a good reason for this. There is no chairs mic. <laughs> so we're using the, we're the first meeting in the first meeting. Ah, okay, yeah, but uh, we're using one of the one of the the, the the mics in the in the room. So normally you should hear us. So uh, maybe a, a brief. Okay, so uh, taking over just to, to to give you a super brief overview of what has been happening in the past couple of months. So we were chartered uh, a little bit more than a year ago. So we adopted the documents. We we're working really really hard, you know, and uh, with our initial. Um, uh, deadlines uh, in in gray here. So we had six interim meetings between the ITF 99, 90, uh, 80, 98, and 99, and then we had a, the first hackathon over there the, at that point. And uh, since then, we had five uh, interim meetings and uh, a, a new, another hackathon during the the, the last weekend. Uh, so pretty interesting uh, results there. And uh, I really do hope that we'll continue this uh, tradition, and I'm confident that we'll continue, and we'll have a very, uh, a, a, a very good implement open source implementation from the next ITF. So we're continuing this uh, rhythm with the interim meetings and with the hackathon. And with this going on, we are actually pretty close to fulfilling. You know, the, the, and we're very advanced on our current chartering uh, charter. And uh, we discussed already a couple of times the new items on which we'll be working in the in the following uh, in the following months and in the following year, and this boils down to four uh, major points. And basically, of course, there are, there were some others, but we would like to focus today on on these uh, on these four. The first one is Chic over Foo, so the different documents for adaptation of the Chic mechanism to the specific particular technologies. ICMP v6, so chic for ICMP. Yep. Just to mention, when we mean chic over food, we don't mean one document which has chic over all the foods, right? Uh, we expect and we'll see this meeting that we already have some. Sorry? Use this one. Okay. okay. Uh, so it's not one chic over food document, but uh, as many chic over foods as candidate technologies because each one has specific requirements and chic is a very general ar architecture level thing. And when you want to go down to one particular uh, technology which has these particular requirements, for instance, frame size, upstream versus downstream, etc., that's when you have to have, oh, I, how do I implement the chic in that particular use case? And, and we already have two documents on that family and we have four, four technologies that we support, so we expect we could have up to four documents and maybe even more, um, depending on, on what people, uh, where people want to use Chic right now. So we are still open to see more Chic over food document coming in. But, so exactly, in this line of thought, today we have two presentations that are coming later. So we have uh, Ivailo and Alper that are going to be presenting remotely. And th this one doesn't go through the, the the internet, no, at all. So I think it's better. So we'll have we'll 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 have our token of speech here. Uh, so uh, yeah, we have uh, Ivailo and Alper that are going to be presenting the first draft, and uh, Juan Carlos that is going to be presenting the second draft of the of the of the two do uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, that's a really great start, I think. Um, so on this point, we, we're good to go. Uh, we also have uh, Chic for ICMPv6, and there is another draft that is out there, and uh, we're really happy about this, that we're talking about real documents that are out there and people that are identified and companies behind this, so that, that's really, really good. Um, on the data model for Chic context, so during this hackathon, we had the opportunity to actually improve the Yang models, that uh, module that we had uh, since the last hackathon. So uh, there is no draft yet about this, but the Yang model is there. So there were a little bit of, there were several changes that happened, that minor changes, but there were that happened to the context definition since the last uh, ITF. And uh, right now they are applied into the Yang model. Uh, so uh, pretty soon uh, we'll be actually uh, publishing the Yang model and, uh, and, and uh, we'll be able to be using it to serialize the, the contexts. So that's a really good start and uh, I think that we'll be able to, to go on from there. And the final point is the 
the protocol that we are actually going to be using for context provisioning, because that's going to be also of crucial importance in order to be able to achieve interoperability. So what we'll be looking at is defining a minimal protocol, minimal context provisioning protocol, so that we have a very good basis to, to start on, you know, that we can have our interoperability testing and all these parts, uh, something that is able to serialize the data model. Uh, and uh, from there on, of course, we can do some extensions. But what we would like is, you know, not go to a full-blown solution where we have like a full architecture and spend months and months and months and desi designing some super beautiful architecture that in the end, you know, people are just going to be saying, okay, you know, I don't care about this complexity or, you know, it doesn't really fit my case. And then we spent like two years on discussing how is this perfect architecture going to be looking at. Like we want a very minimal protocol that is able to, we are able to do the bootstrapping I mean, sorry, I don't want to use the bootstrap because that's a very loaded word here. So that we are able to, to have something that interoperates, which we can share the context and we and this works. And from that on we can, you know, we can see where it goes. So uh, there are two questions to the room. The first question will be uh, for each of these items, if we have a critical mass of people who would be interested in working on it. So uh, for Chic Over Foo, uh, we already have two documents, so I'm, I'm kind of positive. Um, so, are there people in this room who are interested in participating as a reviewer or as an author, etc., to work on Chic Over Foo? Please raise hands. So, I'm seeing. Okay, so I'm seeing a good number of hands already. So, I, I see that this, this is interesting. Uh, same goes for ICMPv6. I don't know how to count people that are online because we have quite a lot of people online. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, okay. You're representing the online people? Okay, that's good. Um, so ICMPv6, uh, do people think that there is interest in doing ICMP? We have already have a draft. So people in this room would be interested in participating to the work or to the review of this document, of this work? I see one hand, two hands, three hands. ICMPv6, more. Yeah, this looks like an interesting topic. And me too, obviously. Yeah. Uh, data models for chic context. So uh, as you understand, this is to populate for each device which has a different set of rules. How do we populate the rules at the, the important places in, in the network? Um, so what's the data model for this? Uh, interest? People want to work on Yang or something like that in this room? I would like to see more. It looks like a... a Yes, I see five, six. Because I, I don't see how this is going to work if we don't have this. So, hi, I'm Carlos Oniga. I think uh, probably what uh, we are experiencing here is that uh, people don't necessarily understand what exactly we're trying to do. Uh, right now, it's just one uh, line there, uh, okay. and we haven't, we don't have a draft, and we have not uh, had much presentations about it. So, uh, so we have had offline discussion, so I, I rec recognize the people that are raising hands because we pretty much don't know what we are talking about, but I'm not surprised to see all the rest of the people not knowing exactly what we're talking about. Okay, so probably so it will be a good idea to at least plan to explain and, and do like we did last time at the Yang, Yang of Things uh, presentation, which was specific to, to this topic, some sort of intro, you know, to the broad LP1 community, explaining what are the benefits of, of this data modeling for chic contexts, and how can they be achieved, talk about Yang, and then I'm, I'm sure we will see more hands uh, getting uh, raised. So, so what form do you think we should have this? We, we, could, we could have some slides at an interim meeting. Yeah, yeah, that would be perfect. But I mean, not the, so many people attend the interim. Well, that's, that's um, the... But we can't wait for the next meeting to just show people what it is. We can summarize in two words right now, or we can already have people start a solution draft, which explains all this. Yeah, I think either is fine. That we just need to go through that education phase. So, so one of the things is that there is already one Yang module that is out there, so we can just fire it up to the mailing list, and people that are interested can look at it, but you, generally it needs the text around it, right, to, to explain right, right. it. But, that, but then I think we're, we'll be back to, okay, you read that Yang model and then you and need then, to understand what it is for, so. Uh, 
So, okay, Let, let's see this document and let's schedule time in the next interim meetings to, to elaborate on this. Yeah. But basically, for those who don't know what we are talking about, the chic compression needs a state in the compressor somewhere in the network to talk to a particular device, and each device will have its own set of compression rules, meaning that there is a need to express those rules so as to publish them where it's needed in the network. If we don't have that, we won't be able to deploy check. So there's a high need for doing it. Right, so that's why we, we are proposing chatter. Okay. Yeah, and, and then we have the minimal context provisioning protocol, MCPP, uh, or something. Uh, and uh, yeah, we will we'll need to, to figure out, and this I think will come very naturally after we, we found, what we, we see how what we do with the data model. Uh, so, do, do are there any people that are particularly interested in this part, on the, like the context? Comp oh. Yeah, Juan Carlos. Uh, yeah, one. Sorry, again, Juan Carlos on you. Uh, are we planning to discuss architecture at all, or uh, or just assume that this is a protocol from somewhere to somewhere? So I um, I think that we don't want to spend too much time uh, discussing all the possible architectures out there. That, that could solve this problem. So I think that we should aim for something super minimal. Maybe the, one of the use cases to have, okay, like end device, uh, like the, 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 the end device and the, the, the compressor in the network, and they talk to each other, and maybe the end device sends all this, even if it's like one time, one is in its lifetime or something like this, so it sends the context that is provisioned. So this is one super simple use case. Maybe we try to, to solve this one. And and then we we see how it goes from there. So super simple architecture, basically. So so maybe one 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 proposal or that I could think of is is try to base as much as possible on the overview draft exactly. that it's already out there, right? We have already an architecture. So try to at least map that protocol to to those elements and then explain how it could potentially be implemented. I think that will also help people understanding what what is the benefit of this. That's what I wanted to say. So. Okay. So yes, for those who did not go through the overview, the overview has effectively uh, a good section on uh, uh, generic architecture. So, so if you want to find the names of things, for instance, and stuff like that, we, it took us a long time to just enumerate how the different network elements were called in various technologies and give them a name, a generic name for this group, etc. And we are using the, the LP1 overview as the reference for all this terminology and for the function placement, etc. So all the documents, and, and there's still effort to be made, for instance, in the co-op document to realign to that, but that's our reference. We could have tried to make a real generic architecture, etc. But but that's a hat all, um, and, and we would have spent too much time in doing something too generic that nobody would ever have implemented. So we, we just did the overview, which has this simple positioning of things and naming of things, and, and we have to live with this. Okay. Yes, Laurent Toutain. So we, we have now a document about co-op, mm. but it's very generic. And in fact, when we do the compression, we move all the items that were specific to co-op to the IPv6. So maybe we can use the rechartering phase to, to have something specific about different co-op flow we can have coming from different platforms and say uh, how we can compress uh, uh, lightweight M2M over co-op, or we can compress Comai over co-op, and so I have to specific study for different uh, platform and put it in the charter. So, so, so yeah, yeah. Just, just, just a question about this. Is it something like an informational document that says, okay, these are the types of flows that yes. would be applicable to the co-op compression? Yes, to explain. So we have something that explain how we have chic overflow, so that's the lower uh, layer, and then how we can put the platform of a co-op, so this way we... So it's bar over chic, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's a good definition. Hi, Hannes. I, I like the idea if you could do some work on, on co-op compression, but it actually requires you to specifically look at flows. It's, uh, it's something you probably have investigated a little bit more. Um, 
And obviously it would be useful if this is independent from the lower layers as well, because uh, specifically some, some people are using uh, co-op and, and like with MDM and other things on top of, directly on top of some of the link layers uh, without using IP underneath. And it would be nice if that still works and you, those, those people could reuse that type of or your work that you're doing in this group. So um, I would be very much in favor of adding that investigation to the uh, chartered items. But it's an informational document or some other document, I don't care. Okay, so that, that's really, uh, thank you, thank you, Hannes. That's a really excellent point. I think that given that also we have Wyson in, in the charter that is IP enabled, and it's really interesting to be able to compress the co op part to run on, over Wyson. So that's a good reasoning uh, about this, um, about the technologies that are not using IP. Uh, the, the initial reaction that I would have is that one of the reasons that we are here and one of the reasons we are doing this is to enable these technologies to become IP again. If the, we're not going to force anyone here, of course, but to give them the tools to, to re-become IP at no cost, let's say. That's great. Um, and you're already doing that right now. But I'm, I'm thinking sort of, I see that rechartering and this work on co-op compression is sort of a second phase. And if someone does the first thing already, I, I, it's more like Lego, you know, put the different things together. I don't know if the compression algorithm works that way, but uh, it would be great if it would Yes, I, I, I just think that the, the uh, chic over foo documents, and now I'm talking to Juan Carlos within the mic list here, um, should probably have recommendations for application writers. Because having bar over chic and, and putting things over IP doesn't mean that you can do anything with the underlying technology. There will still be constraints coming from the underlying technology that you cannot ignore. So probably, does. If there could be a section in all those chic overview for the application writers, uh, that could be useful. So that that's for Evalio, that's for Juan Carlos, and whoever wants to write a chic overview, having some application writer recommendations. Suresh? Uh, Suresh Krishnan. So one of the things like where we are doing all this like um, co-op stuff is to kind of uh, improve the efficiency of compression by nailing down the stack, right? Like, so if you know, like, what are the things underneath you, you can do a better job than um, not knowing it. So I don't mind if, like, you know, we do something with co-op that kind of works with other link layers with the lower efficiency, but I don't want to spend time, like, specifically working on it. So, like, I, I'm fine with, like, what Hannah said. So it, it does make sense, but if it happens to work that way, I think it's fantastic. But if you had to, like, fork off something that only, like, has to work with our IP, then I'm not for it. Like, does that make sense? I, I, yeah, I think I, I I think I understand the point is we should not if if I try to rephrase and you'll tell me if this is we should not remove things f t from consideration if they bring more optimization but they do require to go down to the IP layer. Yeah, but we should not say well you know this is only co-op stuff and uh, this only co-op stuff you know says that we cannot use this optimization. So right, like so, uh, mm. I I want to keep the benefits of the tighter integration, if if at all possible. Like so, I don't want to give it up right away, so we can run on like without IP. Okay, I agree, I agree on this point. Well, you no, know, just to support, I guess the the, the previous uh, speakers, Juan Carlos, and uh, it's worth having a, a topic. We, we we can brainstorm exactly how what's the best way to do it, and if it's uh, over one draft or the others, but uh, it's definitely worth capturing that there is interest in, in, in doing this in the rechartering phase, right? And we welcome draft. I mean, if somebody wants to start a draft on, I don't know, lightweight, M2M, or whatever else, over co-op uh, for, for, you know, how she compresses that or whatever. Yes, we would welcome this draft in the working group. Uh, I would like to see activity, like interested people, etc before making it a charter item, I want to make sure somebody's working on it. But um, Chic Overflow we know, is ICMP we know, data model we know, so that's why we wrote them, we have seen activities. Uh, I, so if, if you want it in the next charter, or some, some, something, over, so bar over Chic, uh, whatever that can be, please start writing drafts and let's see the activity on the mailing list and let's see if we can steer enough interest to make it a working group charter item. Okay, and with this we move to the... Yeah. And with this, we move to the next item in our present.
Yes, so LP1 overview. Um, so Steven is not here today with us, so I'm going to be stepping up for him to uh, to just give a very, very short and very brief overview of uh, the LP1 overview and what's been happening with this document. So uh, before I start here, I would just like to, to express, of course, all the work goes to uh, the contributors and to Stephen. So it it is a document that has more than 12 contributors. And I think that uh, I see already a thing that we should ask to, to add, I think Charlie, should also go into the, the list of contributors. And I think that this is something that we had not put there. So please, sorry, Charlie, for about this. So this is really an amazing work from my perspective. And um, is it the right, can you, can you go to the next slide, please? So about the document. So a very, very short refresher of what this document is about, because of course you already uh, know a lot about it. So it has like, four main sections, the baseline technologies, so it does an overview of four baseline technologies, it introduces some generic terminology and some generic architecture, and then it provides gap analysis and uh, some common security considerations. So for me, this is a really, really, really excellent document to go on for a person that knows nothing about LPNs and go down and, 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 and learn about the main technologies that are out, out there and some of the really important properties that help us develop uh, the, our, uh, our standards. So uh, the big picture, like very, very far away, provide enough background information so that the work group can make sufficiently informed decisions while doing standard track work. So this is the, the background and so, um, um, while I'm presenting also, I did the, the shepherding review of, of this document. And uh, I must say that uh, it really, it's a very interesting process. It's the first time I was doing shepherding. And uh, I actually looked back at the whole process, the way the document was, was, was developed. And I really, really find a very, very rich document. So, it is uh, lots of constructive discussions on the mailing list on a topic that is not particularly, it, it's not simple if you look at it from, from far away, right? But a lot of discussions, many people were, were doing this. Uh, it, 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 it represents a big investment in time, in, in efforts, in, uh, yeah, and, and in discussions from many, many people. It has actually, it is the basis of four, at least four big drafts that are on the different baseline technologies plus several more on the gap analysis and the and, and all this. So I think that it's a really, really great process when you look from where we are today, we have the LPN overview document, and when we look back, there were many, many individual drafts, many, many drafts that are actually supported and provided by alliances, companies, individuals, that actually were then combined, and there were all the discussion of how do we make this thing. Then. So I really love the process. We did the IPR review, and there is no RPR on this uh, document, in this particular document. So it was far up, uh, and, and, and really happy about this. I don't remember if there is any more slides on this. Yes. So uh, we managed to, to, to do all the things that are necessary by this ITF, and as Suresh said, we fired up for uh, we, we sent uh, we, we sent the uh, to submit it to ISG for publication. So that was done. Uh, the last week, and we have uh, the reviews that were requested by the IOTDR and uh, INT uh, directorate. So we'll have the reviews of the document, uh, and uh, you know, we hopefully we'll be able to get it for our last call, ITF last call, by the end of the year, as Suresh uh, just uh, uh, announced this. So um, about the new work, and this actually comes back to Juan Carlos' comment from and, and to the uh, other comments during the discussion, we have new work coming. And we'll really uh, suggest that the authors and the, 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 and, and the writers of the new documents take a look at this LP1 overview that has, it is really a very rich source of information. It has already been cited and used in many, many external reviewers and external resources outside the ITF because the ITF is viewed as, uh, you know, this authority that is out there. And there are very, very few, if not to say none, of 
authority uh, uh, document that actually describes in such detail this variety of LPON technologies that boils down this common architecture, that boils down this common terminology. There is nothing out there that is at the same level of quality, same level of investment, same level of endorsement. So this, even though for us it's like we say, okay, let's do this informational document that will help, help us do the real work, it is actually out there already serving people, serving the, the, the industry. So I would like just to thank very much all the authors, all the contributors, everyone that was participating in the mailing list, everyone that contributed uh, and, and that got over this long process. So thank you very much and uh, really congrats on the amazing work that you have all done. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll keep this one. And uh, with this, we'll be moving on to the chic documents. So, uh, Laurent, maybe you're the one presenting. And we'll start with the static context HC and the compression. And uh, I have one. Let me dig it for you. There is one here, I think. Here, here. Okay, so I will present you one part about um, compression and fragmentation, and Juan Carlos will uh, Cal Carlos, sorry, will continue with uh, uh, the fragmentation. So here is a delta between the previous version and version seven, that is the current version of, of the draft. So what we we have done, so in in the compression phase, there is uh, not a lot of changes. The, the main change is that we introduce in uh, the context the length of uh, of the field, so that can be useful for in certain scenario. We also agree on the names that we are using for fragmentation, and we have also now a state machine that is uh, quite impressive about the fragmentation in the, a different mode. And what um, we have to do right now is to uh, make a little change in the text to make it clearer. But we have now all the topics. We have a very stable do document. So what we have changed here, it's not very nice for the second one, but uh, here we have the, so we have introduced this field here that is a fin length. So now in the context, we have the fill ID that say, tell you what, what is the nature of the field. Then we have the position, et cetera, et cetera. And we had the fin length. So, what is the interest of this? When you have IPv6 or UDP, is not very useful because you know the length. But when you have co-op, you have some fields that are variable, like URI path or this kind of uh, cray, URI cray. And so for this, we have two situations. For example, you have a protocol that uses uh, always the same length for fields. So let's say that URI path is four bytes long. So if we use this field, we can say it's four. And this way, we don't have to send the length every time we send this uh, URA path. And for other protocol, URA path we have a, will have a variable length. And therefore, when we do the serialization, we will send the length before the value. So this way, when we have something that uh, URA path is fixed, we don't have to send the length on the radio so we we don't we have you we save some extra bits. So the modification has been done on the rule, and is not very clear here, but on all the examples. So the other thing is that we make a consensus on the name for fragmentation. So before we in the document we have the window mode on the packet mode, and now we just focus on the window mode. It means that we send an acknowledgement from time to time and not only at the end of the, all the fragmentation process. So we do this right now because it's, we will have trouble if the packet is very long, then the bitmap that acknowledges the packet can be also very long and cannot enter in the acknowledgement part. So we have to define another protocol and it makes things more and more complex. That's why we want something that is very simple, but works for 
a lot of uh, situation where we, we keep the window mode. So now in the window mode, we have three behavior. One is for no hack. So you send the information and at the end a MIC to guarantee that everything has been well received. We have hack on error. So we do the same thing. But when we detect an error during the window, the receiver will send a bitmap that say which bit, which fragment are missing. And we have hack always that is more formal, where every at every end of the window, then we send an acknowledgement to tell if it's OK or not. So we introduced new vocabulary, mainly on the, so we introduced uh, all, all the notion of all zero and all, all one. So it's a fragment compressed number. So all zero is a fragment compressed number with all the bits set to zero. And all one is a fragment compressed number, FCN, with all the bits equal to one. So I, I remind you that all zero is when you are sending, it's sent at each end of the window, and it triggers an acknowledgement uh, all the time in the actual ways on if there is error and a con error. All one is the one that says that this is the end of the frag uh, fragmentation, so the end of the packet. And all one will carry a MIC. So this way we, we can check the integrity of what we, we have received. So with all zero and all one, we can also have some uh, way to do, to send some abort message to stop the fragmentation, for example, for if we have some error of if the sender of the receiver decides that he's not interested to continue the, the process. So I will go into some detail to explain all these, uh, all these things. So here is uh, an example of a fragmentation process. So we, the sender is sending a window here. So uh, 6 uh, to 0 is the fragment compressed number. So we take an example where the FCN length is on three bits. So here we send this. So it's what you read here. The rule on the right is what you receive. So you have rule ID, the D tag, that can be optional, the window, FCN, and then the payload, et cetera, et cetera, until FCN reach zero zeros, which means that this is the end of the window. And FCN zero zero triggers an acknowledgement which contain a bitmap. And that's a little bit confusing at the beginning where you are not used to that because the acknowledgement is a bitmap. So when you look at the numbers, it's not the number of FCN. So it needs some um, uh, training to, to be uh, used to that. But here you have an example of the bitmap. Everything has been received. So all the bits are set to one. So we define the order and the last one is all zero or all one. So all zero and all one takes the same position on the bitmap. Because in a window, you can have only all zero or only uh, all one, but not the two at the same time. So here we have this, uh, this thing. So we trigger the bitmap. And at the end, so for the last window, the last window may be not uh, full, because you don't have enough packet to, to complete it. So what we recommend in the document in the draft is that you use the lowest number to have the last packet that will be one and then all one to say this is the end of the uh, of the fragmentation. And in the all one fragment, as I say, we introduce a MIC that allows us to uh, detect if we have some some trouble in the transmission. So. Here is uh, what we propose also to, to add is an optimization when we send the bitmap. It means that if all the bits of the bitmap are set to one, so we don't have to send them, and the length will help us, help the receiver to know that all these bits that we are not sending are, are equal to one. So that leads to an optimization here. So for example, in this first phase, in the first window, all the bits are set to one, so we will send only a complete byte here with maybe a part of the window. So, but something also that is very important, and we have studied this in detail 
in uh, fragmentation is that the either, either the compressed uh, either or the fragmentation either is not aligned on a byte boundary. So we have to take care of this. And when we are sending information, maybe with this information we have padding. And of course, the receiver is not cannot make the difference between fields and only padding. So that can be a, a problem, and we study this in, in detail to, to avoid problems. So here, as I say, for example, we, you have one bit here that is a bitmap, and we suppress the rest to have an optimization and to save bandwidth. For if you have an error, for example, here we are losing the fragment uh, FCN3, so we have a bit equal to zero here, so we have to send the full sequence and maybe here you have some padding bits that uh, are here. So this is uh, optimization of the bitmap. Another thing that we can use is uh, here, if I'm not wrong, so here is the same scenario. So the same scenario, the only difference is, for example, we are losing the first uh, fragment here of the second window. And so we have a bit equal to zero, and it just shows you that we can continue to have this optimization. It's only when a bit uh, set to zero in the rest that you, you have to send more, more bytes. So what we can do also with this optimization is that playing, we know that now we have the reduce. When we send a bitmap, it's always the smallest one. And so we, we can play with some, if we have bigger value, then we can use them to send exceptions. For example, an abort here is defined as an optimized bitmap plus bits equal to one. So normally it's impossible because if we do the optimization, we will not have these bits equal to one. So if the sender is sending them, it means that the length is not correct. So we can say this is an abort message and so we can stop the, the transmission. So we have this example that is given here. And on the other way, we have an abort that will be to send uh, all one message without the MIC. So normally all the all one message contain a MIC, and if it's shorter, then it's, we can use it to send, uh, to, uh, to show a problem. So this way we play with the length, and so we save the bandwidth and we don't have to create new rule ID or new things that could be a problem because normally we want to restrict the size of the rule ID. So if we create new one, then we can lose some, uh, some space in the frame. So we play a lot with the length, which is a kind of meta information we, uh, we send. So the last uh, uh, thing we add in, in the draft is a notion of empty all one or all, uh, empty all zero, which are used to trigger, to, set, to ask the receiver to send again the bitmap. So for example, in the second phase here in the window one, we have an example where we are sending uh, the last window, so two, one, and seven. So uh, seven, it's all one. So here it triggers an acknowledgement, and the acknowledgement is lost. So in that case, the, the sender can send an empty old one, so without information, and this way it will, the receiver will send again its bitmap. So on, in the bitmap, it will notice what information is lost or, or not, and then resend it again. So for example, in the window zero, we have another uh, behavior where it's the old one that is lost, so the sender start a timeout because you don't receive the bitmap. And here, it's, uh, it's uh, fragment zero that is lost. So in the bitmap, we know that it's fragment zero that is lost. And after, it's not represented in this uh, uh, drawing. But after that, we will have to send again fragment zero, of course, here with the data. So that's the things we, we have introduced as optimization to save the bandwidth when we are doing fragmentation. So that's uh, what we have done right now. So tomorrow we will work more on the state machine and the different phase. But to finish the document, what we have to, to do is to 
finalize the description of abort and the optimization of the bitmap. We have to rewrite the example to take into account this optimization. And we have also to introduce some text because it's something that is quite complex and is not very uh, uh, common, is that we have either that they are not aligned on bit byte boundary, so we have to explain how the padding is done, how you remove the padding when on the receiver, and all, all that stuff. And when we have done that, we, we hope that the document will be finished and that we can publish it. Okay, so if you have questions. Thanks, uh, Juan Carlos. And you got one quick question. There were a few changes between uh, the last versions, I think five, five six, seven, where uh, the, the state machine was moved back and forth between the annexes and, 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 and back to the main body. Uh, was there, like besides editorial, were there like a major changes? Uh, uh, currently, uh, yes, so the state machine has been introduced in uh, draft seven. So uh, now it's in uh, the normative part, but it will be moved to the annex part and the description will stay here. Okay, but that will all be editorial? If, yes. Okay. Okay, thanks. You want a mic or? Okay. I just would like to get a feel that once you've done those changes, move the FSM to an X and, and do these various items, do you think that the document will be ready for workgroup last call for this piece? And then we'll have yeah. for the fragmentation, I'll ask the same question. Yes. Okay, so you're pretty much there. Yeah. So uh, the next item is uh, the fragmentation for which we welcome Carles. Okay, good morning everyone. So I'm going to present the, the second part of this slot, focusing on chic fragmentation. So, uh, since Prague, uh, as uh, Lohan has introduced, uh, we have published two revisions of the document, 06 and 07. And uh, Lohan has already provided many details on 07. So, then I will uh, focus on some of the updates in 06. And also, we'll talk about things that are on the table for the upcoming new version of the document, which will be uh, 08. So the, the plan for 08 is actually to complete the work in 07, as was discussed recently. And uh, we plan to review carefully the document. We need to consider all possible corner cases and try to, to solve them. And by the way, there's this specific uh, side meeting that has been scheduled for tomorrow in Butterworth room from 9.30 to 12. So please be aware of this. And uh, after that, when we publish uh, 08, uh, well, this should hopefully be the, the version that would possibly be intended for working group last call. So uh, let's uh, go through the updates in, in 06. So uh, first of all, there was uh, an update in ACK always. We clarified uh, the behavior of the receiver on when it needs to check the, the MIC after they have been retries in the last uh, window of fragments. So the idea is after the O1 fragment, the, the last one of the packet is received, then the, the receiver checks the MIG after each fragment that's uh, received. And uh, as shown uh, in the figure on this slide, if uh, reassembly is then uh, successful, the receiver uh, transmits the acknowledgement. So still in ACK always, uh, there were two parameters in the previous version, which was 05, uh, max frag retries and max ACK requests. However, uh, based on uh, implementation experience, it was found that uh, actually only the last one was used in practice. So the first one was actually removed. And in addition, uh, still in ACOWIS, we added some text uh, recommending the ACOWIS timer to be reasonably short in order to uh, avoid potentially long uh, 
fragmented packet transmission latency. So then uh, in, about Acone remote, we added uh, the parameter max frag retrace, which was not defined for this mode previously. And uh, the intent here is to mitigate a potential attack that can be performed uh, whereby a malicious node may repeatedly transmit an acknowledgement reporting that there are uh, some fragments missing and forcing the fragment sender to transmit and retransmit those uh, apparently missing fragments. So this would consume valuable resources such as energy, bandwidth and so on. And uh, the intent here is to apply a maximum to the number of fragment retries to uh, have some limitation uh, to the extent of this attack. So by the way, this is also now discussed in the uh, security considerations section. And well, there were also a few editorial updates in 06, a uh, few minor ones in the abstract. Also, uh, we merged former sections 5.2 and 5.3, which provided the definition of uh, the different reliability modes and the discussion of those modes respectively. So we've merged them into a single section which is possibly more efficient and better for the, the reader. And uh, also we added some examples to the appendix to illustrate uh, the behavior on uh, the last window when there are fragment retries as I explained in a couple of slides uh, ago. So, uh, well, there has been the last version published, which is 07, so Lohan has provided many details on that. However, we have continued uh, analyzing the document and we have found some additional problems and thought about possible solutions. So the, the main currently uh, problem on the table is uh, on downlink fragmentation and act always. So we have that in some LP1 technologies, uh, and a blink message is needed in order to enable the transmission of a number of downlink uh, messages. This number currently and typically is one. Um, so because of this, we may find an issue when we have downlink fragment transmission in ACOWIS. So we have this figure on the slide that tries to illustrate the problem that may happen. So in the figure, by the way, a transmission from the right to the left means a downlink transmission. So what we have here is the end device that uh, sends a first a blink message which serves as, as a trigger to enable downlink transmission. And then the network side with the fragment sender starts uh, with the first fragment of a larger packet. Then there's an acknowledgement in response. Then there's the second fragment transmitted all of these, let's assume, are successfully received. But then the second acknowledgement, let's assume, gets lost. So the problem here is that the, the fragment sender has the echo with timer, will try, uh, upon expiration of the timer, will try to transmit the ACK request. However, uh, it will not be possible to transmit such uh, downlink ACK request because there is not an ablink message that enables that transmission. So the problem is that at this point, communication stops. So there's a solution we've been discussing in the interims, which is the following one. The idea is uh, a receiver may support timer-based acknowledgement retransmission. So in, in this approach, the fragment receiver uh, would initialize and start uh, a retry timer after the transmission of every acknowledgement, with one exception, which is the last acknowledgement, which is transmitted in response uh, to the all one fragment, the last fragment of the packet, and if the acknowledgement indicates that there have been no losses. So for all other acknowledgements, this retry timer is initialized and started. So then this timer would be stopped upon receipt, receipt of a fragment uh, from the next window, or uh, upon receipt of a missing fragment from the current window. So then it is if the retry timer expires, then the acknowledgement, the last acknowledgement is retransmitted. So then we also need to add one detail on the fragment sender side, which is that when the fragment sender transmits the last fragment, it initializes or it needs to initialize the ACOWIS timer to a long value long meaning at least longer than the one used for the previous windows and 
long uh, allowing for several ACK retries. So then the idea is that uh, if the ACK always timer for this uh, last fragment transmission uh, expires and no acknowledgement has been received, then the sender makes one assumption here. So the assumption is that the O1 fragment and or the whole last window, if the window is larger than a single fragment, uh, all of that was successfully received. And also the last acknowledgement, which confirms correct reception of the last fragment or fragments, uh, reporting that everything has been successfully received, that acknowledgement has also been lost. Uh, so the, the idea is, this is the most likely situation and this is what the fragment sender assumes. Uh, an alternative, the other possible situation is that, for example, the all one fragment might have been lost and there could have been several ACK retries, but all of those uh, being lost as, as well is something that's quite unlikely. So because that's not unlikely, that is not what's being assumed here. So this is uh, efficient in the sense that we, we avoid to do something strange like the fragment sender transmitting a confirmation that we have received the final acknowledgement and also this is uh, configurable in a way because we can increase the reliability of this last part by setting a high enough a call waste timer. So uh, there have been also some other corner cases we've been uh, collecting. So by the way, the idea is, for example, we have this discussion tomorrow and to, to continue looking at these corner cases in the next days. So a first one is, uh, okay, what happens if the mic check fails but uh, the sequence of uh, FCNs is apparently correct. First of all, the idea is, okay, is this possible at all? And if yes, uh, which should be the reaction of the receiver, especially in the ACK modes? So this is one thing to possibly consider. Another one is a potential issue in ACK on error. So uh, we may have a situation where the sender may transmit all the fragments and all of them could be lost. So because of the NAC oriented behavior of this uh, mechanism, the receiver cannot generate feedback by default. And however, the, the sender would assume that the transmission was successful. So this is a false positive. And we might want to discuss or consider whether it would be good to add, possibly as an option, uh, the option to have a final acknowledgement, which would be transmitted by the receiver unconditionally at the end of the packet, and the idea is that by doing this, we would allow the fragment sender to know, uh, at least in some cases, that there has not been a false positive. So, well, these and other issues or possible corner cases are the ones that we will consider in the next upcoming days. So, uh, I don't know if there, there's any question or comment. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, Juan Carlos Uniga. Just want to make sure I I, I understand the, the and the clarification. I guess when the the mic check you mentioned, I think on slide three or so, uh, it's it's not exactly the same issue, right? That we are talking about at the very end, because uh, you are talking about what is the condition to send the ACK, and if it's based on FCN mic and or and that is the issue, right? Like, what exactly is it the trigger of the ACK? Yeah, so, so it's actually two different situations here. Uh, initially, this problem, uh, the problem was that it was not so clearly specified uh, what was the task of the receiver when they were retries in the last window. Uh, however, what is indicated here is uh, something that might be different, which is, oh, we receive apparently all fragments, all FCNs, have the correct sequence. Apparently, there's no gap in the sequence numbers. However, the mic check fails. What happens in that case? How do we react to that, if that's possible at all? Okay, so that's two different situations. So right now, the spec just relies on the FCN to, to send the ACK and not on the result of the mic? Yes. Okay. That's the point, yeah. And, and maybe, maybe we should consider also adding the mic check. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And for the for the last one, I guess what what you are saying is is an option to the to the NOAC. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. 
Okay, uh, uh, Alexander Pelf here. Just a question uh, on, on this point. It doesn't this mean that there is a transmission error in the data? So you have the FCN that are good, but then you have some problem in the, during the transmission, so the MIC will fail. Sorry, I, I didn't get it because of yeah, the idea. So, so, so here you have the, MC, the MIC check that fails, but FCN is correct. So you received all the frames, but your MIC is bad. So maybe it's just during the transmission you had some bits that went bad during the transmission. So you can drop it. Or, you know, okay. So just for understanding. Yeah, I guess that's one thing. Maybe there could be some abort message. So we might need to, to know what is the reaction to that, right? I understand that as a, a CRC undetected error, right? So you have many bits which are lost and you have a chance out of two of the power 16 or something that, that the wrong frame gives you the right CRC. So that can happen, very rare. You must detect it and abort or drop the thing. You can't know which one of all the packets at the wrong CRC, you need to drop the frame. But you need to know, don't stay hung there, just abort or whatever. Yeah, Dominic Barton. I think we're discussing something that should never happen. So I'm, I'm not sure we should spend too much time on specifying what happens in some case that never happens. Just, yeah, just make sure it doesn't lock the state machines forever. That's it. Yeah, but I have a very, very uh, bad experience of ignoring that problem. Uh, hanging visa for hours on all South America because of an undetected CRC error. So right. it can saying, happen. Make sure it doesn't lock, but don't yes, specify make, what to do just in that case. Detect it, abort. Right. Don't do anything complex on it. Just make sure it don't stay. I agree with, uh, with this, but one thing that we didn't uh, specify in the document is the MIC algorithm. So one question is, do we define uh, a generic one that we can apply, a default one, even if it's not a good one. We are very lucky in uh, in Shake because we have context end to end, uh, um, in the, so we can change a MIC without any problem if we find something better. But we have to start with something, so like a CRC thirty two or or something like this. So do we specify something in uh, the global document, or we just rely in uh, Shake of a foot? To, to have some uh, MIC algorithm. Well, my, my own opinion on this, uh, if I may, is that possibly, uh, I, I'd say that the best place would be to to define specific mix for chic over food, because we might uh, optimize the, the kind of MIG we are using or, or the selection of the MIG to the specific characteristics of the underlying technology. However, I don't know if that's I think Sheik should have defaults for everything, and the overfoo should override those defaults if they need. Okay, let's go for a default. So, uh, just um, a, a last uh, point after this presentation has ended. I feel really very happy with all the things that have been happening on the mailing list and during the last interims and all the advancement that have been made to the uh, to the document uh, because right now we have the, the FSM, we have the state machine, we have, we are right now, the, the, the way I see the work is like really narrowing down the final uh, bits of the, some corner cases that might arrive in some uh, very specific scenarios in a type of technologies that we have never seen before, and type of behavior that is super rare until now, and will become more and more and more and more ubiquitous in, in the world of IoT. So what the people of, of this standard, are, of this draft are doing is really, really, I, I love it, because it is something that a lot of people the, and developer team that are doing IoT now with these technologies, they are inventing on the go. And I can assure that they never, never go into dive, diving so deep in, in details like this. So we end up with things that get deployed and you have never seen like someone going into, okay, what happens in the case where I have 
this type of message is sent and then I miss this type of acknowledgement and da, 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 da. So I think that the compression and the fragmentation here is we are really, uh, and, and from the feedback from Laurent and from the feedback from Carlos, and I hope, hopefully I hope that tomorrow morning during the meeting of the fragmentation we will be really working on a very uh, close formation to, to, to clear out all the, all the, all the, 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 the details that, that, that are there to be cleared. I, I think that we will have uh, something really, really, really great and uh, that is simple to implement, that is really efficient. So I'd like also to, to thank you and to invite everyone else that, that's here that will be interested in, in into coming and, and participating into this uh, meeting. Please do so. It is in, in which room is it? it was it Carlos? Sorry? Better world or something. So, so look for this room and it's in the slide. Okay. So um, thanks a lot, guys. And now we move on to the co op uh, presentation. So, Chic over co op. Uh, Laurent? Co op over Chic, yeah. So it is a very short presentation because we don't have done a lot of work on, on these things uh, last time for a reason that we explained before. We focus, we spend a lot of time on, on fragmentation and all the good stuff that were designed for co-op has been put in the IPv6 uh, draft. So there is no specific things for, for co-op. So the, the goal now is more to study, as I say in a comment, the, the platform, what kind of co-op traffic we have and how we can use chic rules to compress this traffic coming from uh, uh, Komai platform, uh, uh, lightweight M2M platform, et cetera, et cetera, to see what is the best compression for, for this. So I think it's what we will do in this document or in other document if we go more specific for our platform. So related to this question and also to the, thank you, uh, to, to this question and also to the questions that were, that we had during the first part of the meeting, um, this would mean that we might need some kind of informational document or something at least for specifying the, the types of traffic that we would like to compress with co-op. And maybe that's a, a, a point here. Who would be interested to work or to contribute some like traces of co-op traffic that they would like to compress or, you know, just specify like work on, on, on the different type of scenarios? Who would be interested in the room to, to work on this? So we have uh, around six people there in, in the room. Uh, so I think that we will need a little bit more of, uh, of, uh, of this. Uh, so six is not bad. It's, it's, it's good, very, very good. But I think that it would be good if we have more uh, input also maybe from the core working group, uh, Karsten, to, to see the type of traffic that we might be willing we, we might be interested in compressing so that we goes into this document. Do you feel that this is the, the way to go, like have an informational document or, um, because at this point we need to go like some kind of profiling for co-op and we need the profiles in order to build this profiling. Carsten Bowman, yeah, it would be a good thing to, to uh, make this uh, play again at the core meeting and on the core mailing list and, and ask people to, uh, contribute. Um, for 6 open at the time, um, I had a repository where we collected traces, and that was really useful when we did the generic header compression okay. uh, work, so maybe we should actually set something up for uh, that, for co as well. Okay, I, I, yeah, I, I love it. So I think that this is uh, a thing to do, set up a uh, repository and put traces there. Sounds perfect. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Karsten. And uh, Dominic, you're for the next presentation.
Good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so why are we interested in ICMP v6 in this working group? Well, um, we feel that whenever we tell people this network is IP, then we know people expect to be able to do a few things like uh, get the delivery error messages over ICMP. Uh, they want to do a ping, a trace route, and so we feel, you know, if we IP enable LP once, and people are going to ask questions about all of that. So uh, this draft talks about um, what we do in that respect, and more specifically, uh, what we do in uh, with regards to RFC 4443, which is a basic basic ICMPv6 uh, RFC. Uh, we haven't touched the uh, extended formats, uh, which are defined in uh, 4884, and we haven't uh, looked at uh, 4861 either. So right now we're, we're not interested in that, the ND part. Uh, I We are aware that there was a draft that was submitted uh, about six months ago uh, regarding that area, so we're not overlapping with them, uh, except maybe just for the echo reply, echo request. I think they had the proposal as well. Um, so what is in uh, 4443? Uh, it defines, as I said, the basic ICMPv6 message format. Uh, so it has a format, and then it defines six uh, messages, four of the error class and two uh, of the informational class. The error messages are destination unreachable, uh, which you expect to get when your IP uh, packet didn't go through. Uh, the packet too big error message, uh, if it couldn't be transmitted on the link. And the, the time exceeded message, uh, which could return either uh, a code number indicating that it's a time, actually a time problem or a hop limit problem which is apparently more frequently used than time, so the, it's kind of a misnomer, but uh, it's called time exceeded even if it's used for hop limit. And this is used by trace route. Um, so if you do a trace route, you will increment the uh, hop limit and you expect to get a, an error message of this type uh, at each successive hop. And this is how you see the, the route that's been followed by your packet. Um, and the parameter problem, uh, which could be any other field that was uh, incorrect for delivery of your IP packet. Um, and then the informational message is a famous uh, echo request and echo reply, which is used by ping. And um, so this, draft, this RFC mandates that uh, host uh, listens to the uh, equal request and responds with an equal re reply. So this is the general behavior that's expected from an IP network. And so the question is, uh, what do we do here? And uh, at this point in time, um, we are just opening the discussion and that's where we want feedback on all this expected behavior from an IP network. Do we want this to happen on the IP enabled LP ones? Or is it a bad idea? But I think we should describe what happens. Uh, if we decide we don't do something, then we want to write that we don't do it for a reason. So people don't ask for it again and again or don't expect it. And so here is a list of uh, situations that we consider in this draft and a few potential answers. So the first question is, as uh, the first scenario is, uh, an IP source on the internet sends uh, to a destination that is a device over the LP1. And the, let me see, yeah, the, uh, the delivery has a problem. And so do we expect the, the sender to receive an ICMPv6 uh, message back? And I think on, in this case, it's pretty clear, yes, we do expect that to happen as much as possible. Uh, where should this uh, message originate from? Uh, well, 
as much as possible, not from the device itself. If we, if the network, if the uh, IP chic uh, core compressor uh, detects uh, issues, then it should send the ICMPv6 message back from there and not go all the way to the device as much as possible. So this is a kind of situations we describe in the draft. Uh, now, the second situation we're looking at is the device sending an IPv6 packet to some destinations uh, over the internet. And um, if there is a problem delivering this uh, packet, for example, destination is no longer reachable, do we expect uh, the device to receive an ICMPv6 message back from somewhere? Yes or no? And if it if we do expect it to receive an ICMPv6 message back, where should this message be generated back to the device? And so uh, my feeling is that, yes, we do expect the ICMPv6 message to be sent back. And um, so we should be able to, uh, and it, it's likely to be generated somewhere on the internet, uh, on the intermediate routers uh, close to the destination. And so we will have an ICMPv6 message going back through the internet to the chic core, and then we should be able to compress it and send it back to the device. So we probably need to address that and, and provide explanations on how this happens and how efficiently chic can do that. Uh, another situation is a user on the internet, maybe not aware that the device is uh, over LP1. It's just a, an ordinary IP device. And so the user uh, wonders what happens and uh, how this, uh, this IP host gets reached and does a trace route. So do we expect this to work? And uh, will the user get a response from his trace route command? And what should it look like? So of course, as we increase the number of hops and go through the, the, the IP network, we should get the regular trace route answer. But now for the last hop, which is supposed to reach the IP host, uh, what will happen? So do we want that last uh, message to go to the device? Uh, maybe not. Maybe by default, we want the chic core to respond back uh, to the user on the behalf of the device. So we provided suggestions on that. Um, okay, opposite situation. Does the device want to do a trace route? Well, uh, probably not. Trace route are usually done by human beings and the device is not uh, handled by human beings. So I don't think we should care about that. So we should just say uh, we will not uh, expect the device to do a trace route. Uh, now the ping, user doing a ping to the device. Yes, we expect this to happen and we, we want to respond correctly and accurately to that. And then uh, does the device uh, want to do a ping? Uh, we're not sure, so we're looking for opinions on that. Maybe yes, I don't know. So, Yes, and, and maybe we will have also to generate new type of uh, of message for ICMP error message, for example. We may have something that say not in a rule. So when you send a message to a chic compressor, you you receive an unreachable message and say not in rule. And this way you may know, or the, the, the guy on the internet may know that it's reaching a LP1 network by this uh, specific uh, type. Right, so there are several levels of uh, questions that we address in this draft. The first thing is this scenario, do we want to consider those and provide meaningful answers? And then if we do, then how do we do it? And yes, as Laurent said, uh, there are suggestions in some items that we think we want to address. We have suggestions to add new codes and, and be able to uh, be specific on the fact that it's uh, LP1. Uh, Pascal Tuber, actually an answer to Laurent, it's, it's not really your prime, it's his prime. Um, we, we need to go to ICMP and be able to, to respond with a new ICMP that Chic cannot compress this message and therefore Chic cannot 
this message cannot be sent to, to a, the, the device. It has nothing to do with, uh, well, it is a new ICMP message, but it's not, it's not your document. It's, it's really, it's, it's a separate thing. We need it, but it's not you. Right, this document is just about what should happen. Do we want to, care, do we care about this situation? So if the, the answer might be, yes, we, we, we go to some other working groups and, and, and introduce a, a new code or something. But at least we, we list the requirements and, and what we want to achieve. And by the way, since I met it, um, you, have, you have changed the behaviors of ECO and you have introduced also type 012 for yeah. saying how far they go and you have a default of where they go, etc. This is really something we want to discuss on the mailing list. We don't have much time today, but I would like the mailing list to look at this piece because it's really what the endpoints expects, what kind of attacks can be done, what happens not only if the packet is, uh, for that's a ping with a lot of data in it, that would be fine to ping a PC, it's not fine to ping this device. It could be a dust attack very rapidly. So, so there are all sorts of, of also other ICMP returns back to the host to say, I won't even try to send that to my host or I've truncated it or whatever else. Right, right. You're kind of uh, jumping ahead of my presentation, which addressing the scenarios right now and you're getting it to the technical okay. solutions, but. Yeah, yeah Ron Khan. Well, ju just to close the, the, the discussion, you, you were asking for, for interest support, then yes, I would say that this is definitely uh, relevant for, the, for this working group. And just to add to Pascal's uh, concern, uh, maybe more in putting the hat of uh, Interia, a working group chair. I think definitely this is an issue that once we mature a little bit more the, the discussion here, we should bring it up to, to Interia to, to, to see what they think about uh, these possible changes to ICMP. Right, definitely, thank you. So again, uh, the first thing I want to get from the audience, from, uh, from the working group is what situations, what scenario we're interested in, and then we'll craft the technical solutions to those. So Pascal already mentioned a few things, uh, like we suggesting we could introduce new codes for eco request and reply, which currently have the code field always zero. Uh, so that's one technical solution. We have a few other um, technical issues uh, that may come up, like um, the error message that ICMPv6 uh, uh, sends back, um, according to the RFC must contain as much of the offending IPv6 packet uh, so that the uh, the sender of the IPv6 packet can uh, relate the error message back to the packet it, uh, that created the error. And so now we have an interesting situation where uh, if we want to send that error message back to the device on the LP1, we need to compress that uh, ICMPv6 message. So not only do we need to compress its header, which we can do with chic roots, but we also need to uh, compress the, the payload of that packet, which is the header of the IPv6 packet that created the error. So now we're trying to compress UDP IPv6 header carried over ICMPv6 UDP IP. And so it's, you know, all this stuff that needs to, to be compressed. So how do we do that? Can we call chic within chic or something? Uh, so that's an interesting question. And also we had a discussion about um, um, trace route, uh, which is usually used this way. Um, you send an IPv6 uh, packet to a supposedly unused UDP port to generate an error at the destination. And so now we send that message to a device over the LP1 and we reach a chic compressor on the way to the device and the chic, there's no chic rule to match that UDP port because you uh, intentionally used an unused port. And so what happens? Uh, originally, the chic draft said, if you, find, if you receive a packet which has no rule for it, you drop the packet. So you won't get the answer on the trace route. Uh, now, I think the new version says, if it doesn't match a rule, then you send it uncompressed to the device. Uh, so do we want that to happen? Send an uncompressed packet for an unused port just to get the error message back from the device? Probably not, so we need to find a solution for that as well. There's a question on Jabber <clears throat> from Diego. Uh, how do you differentiate this draft from draft Legos uh, 
LP1, IVCMP, V6, static context, etc. Uh, hi, hi, Diego. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned that before in my slides. It's, see, your draft is a reference at the bottom. So we uh, we do not address uh, ND at all. Um, the, there is a little overlap uh, in the echo reply and echo request message that you also described in your draft. But I think we provide it in a much more generic way. And again, the first thing I want to do is uh, enumerate the situations we want to cover and maybe later provide technical solutions. So if you want to join uh, on, especially if on the echo reply and echo request messages, uh, you're welcome. Uh, but I'm not interested in a ND right now. Is that, uh, or is that a foreign answer? <laughs> Juan Carlos Zuniga, I just want to, I guess, support the, the response from Dominique. Uh, I think that we, we had that discussion in the past that we wanted to focus on on start topologies and we wanted to have as little chatty issues and protocols as possible. So we would not we would not like to bring ND into the, especially on the device side. That would be a killer for this type of network. So. Okay. Um, okay, I think I said that over and over again. So, more questions? So, uh, call for interest. I really see that in this presentation we, we had two things, right? What is the behavior uh, for an ICMP packet, not only on the device, but also on the network elements, which are wrongly named in your document. You have to follow the LP1 overview. Um, in your slide, something was called an NS. There is no NS in the LP1 overview. It's called a, a routing okay. gateway. Uh, I tried to just take a... Yes. And do it again. Uh, OK, so, but, but we, see, we see we have two things, right? So it's good that initially we understand all the corner case that can happen in the radio gateway, in the network gateway. They may have to generate new ICMP errors. I cannot compress this thing or whatever, or I'm overflowed with this, or so maybe that, that, so there's work that we need to figure out uh, looking at chic, et cetera. What does chic generate? What kind of new errors we have there? And then turn that into a document for an uh, interior. That's one thing. And the other thing is really your draft, which is uh, what behaviors do we have? How do we handle those messages? Lagos was really uh, some compression already, but first you are asking the right question. Architecturally speaking, what do we do with these messages? Do we want to support them? And I think it's a, it's a great document. And uh, yes, I, I really wish that we reach out for it. So the next document is uh, Chic over Laura One, and uh, we'll have a remote presentation from uh, Ivilo. Uh, Ivilo, okay. So stepping up to the mic. And you are now the. Uh, I'll get this mic. Then you are now the speaker. Let me put this full screen. Four in the morning. So good morning, Ivalo. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, as Alex said, my name is Ivalo Petrov, and uh, today I'm going to present to you uh, the draft that we started working on with uh, Alper. That's about. Uh, Iva, yeah. Iva, Iva, can we well? just, yes. yes, can you just lower a little bit your mic a little bit because uh -huh. it's uh, quite strong? Okay. Yes. Okay, now is it better? Uh, if a little bit more. Okay, like that, maybe. I, th I think it's good now. I think it's good. So okay, it, perfect. So, yeah, the draft is about the uh, Shikover War One. Uh, the work is being, uh, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, the work is being done in GitHub, so if you want to contribute or um, if you want to see the latest changes, uh, this is the place where you can do that. 
Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, Shik, uh, I hope that everyone already knows uh, what it is. It's a generic uh, compression and fragmentation mechanism for uh, targeting KLP1 networks. And uh, as it was already said in the presentations, uh, there are some parameters and some additional information that need to be provided per uh, each technology uh, for actually being able to use SHIC over any specific uh, technology. Uh, next slide, please. So one of those technologies is uh, War One. It has some very specific characteristics like variable payload size and uh, different device classes uh, that we would have to consider in the, the document. And next slide, please. So in this draft, we'll try to bring, uh, to fill the gap between uh, implementing chic over uh, war one and uh, the chic generic uh, documentation uh, we are uh, providing information for example uh, about uh, timers what are the uh, appropriate values for max retries counts and information for this where it can be put what is what are the appropriate sizes uh, some additional information for fragmentation and, uh, for example, the MIC algorithm, as uh, Luagan said, maybe uh, there could be a generic uh, MIC algorithm that is provided uh, for uh, all the technologies and there might be some more appropriate in the War One networks that already have uh, and that already need a MIC algorithm for their uh, layer two operations. And I'm sure there will be much other, much more questions to answer. So next uh, slide, please. The structure of the draft is, uh, I would say, quite traditional. We have uh, the introduction where we specify the goals of the draft. We have uh, terminology and uh, how it maps to the terminology in the War One world. And uh, then we provide short overviews of SHIP and the War One, uh, having pointers for uh, the documents that describe them in more details. Next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, interesting part of this draft is actually the information uh, regarding uh, the row ID and the computation of, of IID uh, that are for the compression part of the sheet draft and for the fragmentation there are uh, a little bit more things to be defined, like uh, different reliability options that needs and that could be used, and uh, um, how, for example, um, what are the appropriate uh, window sizes that could be used uh, for uplink and downlink, how. Um, those things to work, especially for the different device classes, because uh, in some of them, we can receive multiple downlink messages without an uplink message. So this will maybe slightly change uh, um, the behavior. And next slide, please. Another important point is that the payload size could uh, change independently during the transmission of a fragmented uh, packet. So this is uh, something we will need to consider here. 
hopefully some of the authors of the chic draft could uh, bring some of their insights how uh, whether this is a problem and how to solve any uh, particular situation that could be uh, that could arise and then we have uh, uh, quite a good number of uh, constants that we need to set for example mac ac, a max ac request uh, max uh, track retries for a con error and uh, sizes of different fields like row ID, FCN, DTAC. Of course, uh, we'll provide uh, recommendations and not uh, uh, static values that should always be used. Um, and uh, again, the MIC algorithm, uh, we need to see what's the most appropriate uh, algorithm for those networks. Uh, next slide, please. Fortunately, we have so far uh, a couple of implementations that are targeting specifically uh, War One. Well, not we know that uh, for other technologies, there are also implementations, but we will be able to use the information from those implementations and some real field uh, tests to actually guide us for good values of the different parameters that we need to define. One of the implementations is uh, a proprietary one from ACLIO and uh, there is an open source implementation from IMT Atlantic. Uh, maybe there are also other implementations, but I'm not uh, aware whether they are targeting core one, so I'm not mentioning them. So next slide, please. For this uh, question, whether this is the right place for this work, I think I already uh, pretty much got uh, an answer. So uh, is the working, so I'm going to ask it anyway, is the working group interested in uh, continuing this work and contributing to it? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we discussed in the earlier Richard discussion that uh, LP, uh, Chic over foo is a major item for our recharter. So um, even if we cannot really do that with our current charter, certainly uh, with the new charter, that would be a core item uh, value. So yes, please stay with us. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pascal. Uh, Any question in the room for Evalio? So yes, thank you very much for your attention. If you have uh, any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. And we seem to have one question. Stay with us. Okay. Hello, this is Edgar Ramos from Ericsson. Uh, I have a, a question about the, you mentioned that there are several de device types. Yes. Uh, that is used. Um, how the compressor can know what device type are you going to use so that it can give the right parameters? Uh, so, uh, if, if I can add a, a short thing, yeah. the data model. So, the context and stuff, and you have the data model that can describe this for you. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, that that's just a short intermission to the chartering items that we were that we were saying. So that's a, an excellent question. That's like a generic one. Is how does anyone know about like a generic generic properties of a device or generic things yeah. that could happen to the device? So this is like the big picture view. And sorry, Ivalo, for Laura one, typically there there will be something specific, right? I imagine. Yes. Yeah. Basically, the. The thing is that uh, there are some, let's say, radio-related parameters which are only known by the radio network and the signaling that you have with the radio network that I, I don't see very easily to be mapped to something outside the radio network. 
but then maybe that's part of the discussion uh, in general, not only for, for Laura. Yes, I think so. So basically what you're telling us is that the radio gateway is one good position for the compression because it knows things that the rest of the network doesn't know? Uh, at least some of the parameters might be needed to be handled in a way by that. I see Varu, he was saying yes. Yes, uh, oh. I also have this feeling that uh, it's uh, on the radio gateway that at least some part of the uh, compression and uh, fragmentation might need to be done. Yeah, hello, Julien from Kerlink. So uh, you have to be sure for lower one specifically that the gateway does not know the device information in the lower one. It's not aware of the lower one. The gateway itself, the radio gateway, is just a bridge. It's the great gateway. It does know the, about the lower one specifically. Okay, thanks. I, I think that here maybe this is a, an excellent place to go back to the LP1 overview document. And uh, I think that it's really a good thing to start to, uh, trying to use the uh, LP1 terminology. Uh, because as uh, Julien just said, you know, the, I mean, the gateway, when we, in LoRa, when we, LoRa 1, when we say gateway, there is a very sp particular meaning of it. And it's not the same across the different technologies. And uh, so uh, I think that we should, uh, so I also got like a little bit slipped to this. So we should try to, to use a radio gateway and network gateway. Hmm. So I think that in this sense, it's more about the network gateway that knows more about the, 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 the radio parameters that are happening out there. And, and uh, uh, actually, Edgar, thank you very much for, for this question because that's actually an excellent question from data modeling point of view about the context and all these things because there might be, so here we are doing a, a cross, uh, let's say that we are bringing down the whole stack, IP UDP co-op, we are compressing the whole thing and we can do super efficient things with, like thanks to this. And with your remark, we're actually saying, okay, but we also maybe need to have some exchange between the network gateway and the compressor so that the compressor is aware of some of the things and put this into the data model. So we have also some kind of architectural uh, efficient uh, optimization. And, and the goal is to be efficient and to, to, to ease the life of integrating these networks, like to, of, of people that are actually managing net, these networks, running these networks, and, and, and developing and building applications. So that's actually an excellent point. And there's also this short window of time in some technology, because we are talking Laura here, between a message coming in and an acknowledgement going back. And if uh, those exchanges are done from too far remote, maybe we'll miss the window. So sometimes over satellites, for instance, we've, we've, we've observed this kind of behavior. So a placing, and, and the other thing is maybe the fragment, fragmentation and the rest of the compression do not necessarily need to be in the same box. So function placement is something that should really be addressed in this document. Okay, good. So thank you very much, uh, Ivalo. Thank, thank you. you for staying up so early with us. And uh, so with this, uh, do I need to press the red button here? Mm -hmm. It's not going to explode. Yeah, just pressing it. Oh, goodbye, adios. So next one is uh, Juan Carlos. So Juan Carlos is going to talk to us about uh, Chic Overflow again, but this time for Sigfox. So hello, hello everyone. My name is Juan Carlos Zuniga. I'm with Sigfox, and this is the Chic over Sigfox uh, draft. So this is an, an early uh, draft that we're presenting. Uh, it's mainly an intention to to work on the on the issue after the rechartering. Uh, right now, the, the draft is quite early because we've had a lot of discussions, but they are mainly on the on the drawing board. So we have a lot of things that we want to to capture in the document, but right now they are not quite there yet. Uh, of course, uh, just as Sivailo's uh, presentation, this one will. Uh, focus on the parameters that need to be defined for uh, technology-specific implementations, in this case, uh, Sigfox. Uh, we, we don't necessarily have to focus on different classes and packet sizes because it's more deter deterministic in the Sigfox network. That the, the, There's only one class and one 
size of packet, both from uplink and downlink. Uh, I mean, the one specific size uh, for the uplink and one for the downlink. Uh, what we want to describe is the network architecture equivalences that we have, the type of rules that we are going to uh, consider, uh, uh, how to use them, uh, what are the parameters, uh, optimizations, of course, on the, on the header size, the, the, the timers, uh, the values. Uh, the preferred modes of operation. Right now we have uh, Chic is an excellent uh, baseline to, to optimize for different situations. So we foresee working with uh, at more than one mode of, of operation depending on the specific uh, use. Uh, and, and again, uh, identify the, the optimized uh, parameters and timers. So uh, this is just a reminder. It's already captured in the overview document, but uh, from the architecture point of view, uh, in, in the case of, of the Sigfox network, uh, there's all the devices connected to, to a single cloud. So uh, we have uh, the, the controller, which is basically in, in the cloud with the registration authority and, and multiple base stations in the world that, that provide the, the single connectivity. So if we, if we consider the, the Chic uh, core, it'll be most likely uh, outside the cloud or in the cloud uh, with all the, the Chic functionality in each one of the, of the devices. Uh, yeah, I think the, well, that's that's my last uh, slide. Right now, again, uh, what we are working uh, first of all is on the on the on the compression part, and then we're going to focus on the fragmentation. Tomorrow, we already are going to have a lot of discussion on the fragmentation side. Uh, we have done some 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 studies that I think are are good for for the discussion that we're going to have tomorrow. But uh, whoever wants to contribute to this work, please uh, let myself, Carlos, or Loran know. I guess no more questions. No. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. And I, I like the, the fact that you actually use the architecture from the LPL overview document to do some to provide this mapping. So thanks for, for this. So for the next slot, we, we hoped we would have uh, Benoit from Sixfox to present about uh, LTN at the Etsy. Uh, but Benoit cannot be with us, so uh, we swapped a little bit, and I will give you a, a higher uh, view of, of the work at the Etsy right now. And you know, I'm only half-time participant, participant, so I don't ask me all the deep questions. Keep them for later. And I hope that maybe Benoit will answer them on the mailing list, or will be presenting more specifically on LTN at the next meeting. So with this, uh, some of you, I hope many of you know about the ETC. So the ETC has its headquarters in Sofia Antipolis in France, and they are working on radio-related matters. So you don't expect too much on the higher uh, layers, but uh, they, they are helping us actually on how you can uh, use the radio, uh, in particular in Europe. They will uh, provide you the harmonized standards for using uh, the radio spectrum in Europe. So, and that doesn't seem to work for me. Okay, so I uh, don't want to paraphrase this. Uh, what I want to insist on is Etsy is responsible for the uh, harmonized standards on how you use the spectrum in, in Europe. So you will we'll talk about EN 300 to 20 in particular for the sub gig bands, and that's an harmonized standard which is issued by Etsy. Etsy is, has also created uh, a group called ERM so this is the agenda for these slides. I won't, I won't have time to present all the slides, by the way, but if you're interested in the subject that are written in this summary, uh, they, are, they, they will be discussed furthermore in the slides. Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, oh it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Um, so just like I said, there are a number of, of types of documents that DSC produces. Uh, of interest for us, there are the system reference documents. So system reference is a useful document for uh, other bodies. So ITU uses etc SRDOX. Uh, we might also be references etc SRDOX system reference. They are high level type of architecture document. Uh, of interest as well, the harmonized standards, like I say, 300 to 20 in particular is, is of interest for us because that's where uh, you define the things like the duty cycle in uh, the sub-gig bands. Um, and 
there is a list of, of SR docs. In particular, you see the, the UNB SR docs below sub gig. So it's TR103435. And that gives you how you can do ultra narrow band. And that's for interest. Uh, that's of interest for Sigfox. And uh, the last one, I will explain it a little bit. So there is this ERM TG28. There are a number of, of task groups in ERM. ERM is for uh, uh, radio spectrum, ECM and radio spectrum matters. Uh, so everything which deals with, you know, how the, the, the footprint of the protocols on, on the radios. They won't tell you how to decode the phi, but they will tell you how this phi has a footprint on, on the air, and that will help the harmonized standards to be able to do their work so as to, to, to balance the use of the spectrum between technologies. Next slide. So, 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 so basically paraphrasing here. Yes, yeah, so I, I mentioned EN 300 to 20. There is another one which is of interest, is 303 to 04. And that one is more specific to, to the band above uh, 870 megahertz. Okay, whereas 220 applies to a larger band. All of them are limited to uh, 500 megawatts, uh, milliwatts, megawatts would be big, milliwatts. <laughs> I like this one. And, and <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> well, maybe not. Uh, uh, and, 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 and um, the, the uh, 303 to 204 has also some rules that are more similar to what you do in the US. Uh, with the 400 milliseconds, not megaseconds, of duty cycle. Okay, next slide, please. And more specifically, and more of interest with us, so in the, the ERM TG28 uh, specifically focuses on, on LP1 type of technology. So there are three major activities. One is on LTN. And then at the end, they will be doing a lot more than just uh, looking at the radio footprint. Uh, so LTN is where Sigfox is, is being worked on. Uh, LP1 CSS, so there is an SR doc which is mostly complete on LP1 CSS, that's, that's for Laura. And that will really tell us about the footprint and matching that with the, the radio spectrum usage and the harmonized standards. And then there is a third part piece which, which deals with mesh networks. Next slide, please. Uh, two, two, two. Is it really there? Okay, I'll leave that to your further reading. Next slide. So this is a piece which hopefully Benoit will uh, expand next time. So Benoit has built a, a whole slideware for us on this to, to tell us a bit more about what LTN is doing. And it is my hope, but we'll see if, if that works, uh, that uh, for our rich author, we'll be pointing on LTN as an open standard, as opposed to, to we always mention Sigfox, but that's kind of mixing with a brand name. And it's always hard for us to build open standard and put brand names in them. So it would be uh, actually more uh, politically correct to reference the Etsy documents as opposed to references brand. So that's why I have good hopes in, in the, the work that, that is happening at LTN for us as a reference. And like I said, Benoit will, will explain to us what's going on in LTN. There are some slides done in this slide where which, which give you some hints about that. Next slide. Um, Juan Carlos, if you want to jump on the mic on, on any of them, you're, you're still free, right? So this is basically the use cases for LTN. Go ahead. We, we know that. I mean, this really matches Sigfox. So all you know about Sigfox, there is more than Sigfox in LTN, but all you know about Sigfox pretty much applies. Next. Next. I mean, this is... Okay, and this is this is where... Uh, LTN is a bit above and beyond Sigfox. Sigfox is actually one of the four technologies that they are looking at. And as you see, and one of them is coming from Sony, actually, and the others I don't remember. And, and Sigfox is, is on the left. So 3D UNB would be pretty much Sigfox, if I understand it well. Juan Carlos, tell me if I'm stupid. Okay, and, and for instance, uh, uh, an interesting piece is, is L4, when you can get your time synchronization. So the, the two on the right are synchronized. And uh, L4 would, could pick, it's optional, its time from GPS. Considering the battery operation, that's an interesting trick. But it could pick its time from GPS. Next. And as I said, there is an SR doc, a system reference document for LP1 CSS, which is really 
Laura, as you can recognize it. So the document is 20 odd pages and it will it will show you how radio spectrum is being used by Laura. So it's 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 only a secondary reference for us. Our primary reference would be Laura One, which is also an open standard, so we're happy with it. But but the Laura One won't tell you any much about the physical space, what's going on on the radio. So at least we can we can have that reference. Next. So you, you recognize the LoRa classes. Next. And uh, last but not least, there is the work on mesh. So uh, Bob and Charlie, you're in the room, so if you want to, to tell us something about it. But basically, there is this, this work. This is also happening in TG28. And that uh, basically looks a lot like Wysan, for all I can see about it. And then again, my understanding is that looking at the radio footprint and look, considering the, the impacts on the harmonized standards for it. But if you guys want to participate, I don't know if you do, but there is certainly a, a, an, interleaf, uh, an interoperation between IEEE and this work. Okay, next. And probably you recognize something, Bob and Charlie. So these, these are mesh networks over uh, long distance. Uh, so it's not really 60 ish but if you look at the way it's being done now, they are using time slots, they are doing channel upping and all those things. So there is a real intersection as well with the interest in 60 ish Next. And that's the summary. Uh, so it is considering pretty much every technology that we are working on in this space. They will be uh, making sure that uh, we we get uh, our own high standards that allows us to use the radio spectrum as we need and in a fair fashion. Um, they have three main focus, which correspond to Sigfox, LoRa, and YSAN. Obviously, they don't have NB-IoT and alt -EM here because they are doing it as 3GPP, but they're also <laughs> even more heavily working on this technology. So they are pretty much working on everything we are working in this room on. Next. And this is the author of the slides. Actually, the slides were built for a conference which is happening now, I think, in London. And uh, Yosef is the person who actually wrote it, but they were... Um, validated by ERM TG28, and I got authorization to present them to you today. So thank you, Etsy, for the slides. I'm not ready to take any question, but if you have a simple one, I could maybe help. No? So with this, we will be on the AOB, and maybe if Bob or Charlie want to give us some news about IEEE, before we free everybody from this room. Last chances for the blue sheets. Did everybody sign the blue sheets? Okay, so uh, we just finished up um, our week-long event last week in Orlando, Florida. And for those of us who were trying to get here, <laughs> On uh, Friday night, we wound up uh, in the mess in Orlando Airport, which you probably read about on the news, uh, where they evacuated the whole airport because a camera battery blew up. So, such fun. Anyway, four hours late, nine hours late in arriving in Singapore. Um, so, I'm just going to focus on the 15.4 stuff because, you know, 802.15 has got a lot of stuff going on um, that relate to optical wireless communications and some high rate stuff. But we had two ongoing projects that are already approved and we've been talking about here in the IETF, IEEE aspects. And one of those, the last last of the kind of the in-process amendments is 15.4S, uh, which is uh, titled Spectrum Resource Utilization. And what that is, is adding a lot of management tools uh, to measure channel response and channel characteristics to, to really uh, allow a lot more intelligent application level based management of the channel uh, from for more efficiency so that's actually finishing up sponsor ballot uh, and should be proceeding uh, to IEEE review committee which is the last step in the approval process 
So I fully expect that will be published. Uh, probably a little optimistic. Uh, the December 5th is the meeting date for, for the review committee, and I think it'll probably be January sometime when that's published. So that'll finish up all the current outstanding amendments. Uh, we have a number now, five of them, I believe, um, that are complete. We just finished a revision last year, uh, which is 15.4.2015, and we've opened another project uh, to do a revision called 15.4.2015 uh, revision one. Uh, we're just starting to collect input on that. We have a roll-up uh, from IEEE editorial staff, which includes all the amendments except S. Uh, I think we're going to go on that route. And we've decided uh, at, the, at the September meeting uh, that what we would do is send that out for informal um, electronic ballot the roll-up that we have, uh, just to collect opinions on what might be deprecated, what needs enhancing, what's broken, just a number of things, rather than debate that amongst a rather, a rather small group of people uh, uh, who are IEEE 802.15.4 aficionados who regularly attend the IEEE meetings. We are also sending that to other organizations, so that will be coming here to all the groups that are, you know, we like like six low, six man, core, <laughs> six dish, LP WAN, um, four commentary, you know, so we'll send that around uh, the, the draft roll up um, so that we can collect opinions, not just from those participants within, uh, within the Editor Draft 15 organization, but everywhere else. We'll also send it to the Zigbee Alliance, to Wison, to Thread, um, to ISA 100, and a few others. So. The idea here is to really kind of move this next revision on to something that is uh, very strongly relates to uh, some of the practical issues of the user community. Alex. Yeah, uh, just, uh, just a question on the practical side of how are these requests and like comments going to come here? Like is it there going to be an official letter or? There'll be an official letter, um, which I haven't written yet. In fact, I was supposed to write that right after the September meeting. <laughs> Uh, and didn't do it. Gary Stubing is chairing the activity, but then he couldn't show up in Singapore. So I'm blaming him for the fact that we didn't get it out. But I didn't write the letter. So I'm writing a letter. Uh, it'll be sent out to everybody, probably via email. Um, there'll be a, a comment resolution spreadsheet, uh, you know, so everybody kind of can put the stuff back in a, a consistent form. And we'll roll it up, and we'll treat it just like a letter ballot. I mean, it's just like... Um, you know, just to collect the stuff, and then we'll circulate the results to everybody. To okay, thanks, Juan Carlos. Yes, uh, hi, Juan Carlos. Hi, hey, Bob. Um, yeah, so as you know, I missed the the meeting last week uh, because I had to be here already since uh, last week. But could you just give us a brief uh, update on on I don't I guess at the executive committee meeting on Friday, probably you discussed this bar on the LP1, uh, or is, is there a letter? Oh, I'm, I'm coming to that. I'm nice? coming to that. Uh, the, you, you mean the stuff is coming up in the interest the study group on LP1? Yeah. Yeah, hang on a second. Okay. I'm just going through the two real projects. Beyond that, we have three new work items. Um, one actually is rolling out of an interest group activity. Let me get to that last. Um, one of the new work items is, uh, uh, you probably, perhaps are all aware, but there were some security issues that were uncovered in 802.11 recently uh, that created, um, and in fact, perhaps they're still creating a bit of an industry brouhaha. Uh, we have taken a look at 15.4. I don't think we suffer quite from the same issues that 802.11 uh, has got on that, but uh, it, it just is a wake-up call that uh, we really should be uh, paying attention to how we should be evolving 15.4 or expanding its capabilities to really take into consideration uh, some broader set security. So we just formed a study group called Security Next Generation, um, and it's anticipating uh, the continuing future security. This is the mission statement. Uh, security requirements for 15.4, the 8.15 working group, which is formed a study group for the purpose of developing a PAR. Uh, addressing uh, adding AES 256 support minimally to IEEE 802.15.4 uh, or to create an alternative means likely by the addition of information elements to provide the ability to add AES 256 in other words if we find that the Mac can't support it and add the ability to negotiate the use of other security ciphers suites and key links so uh, there'll be that activity I expect that'll be approved in March um, 
uh, and I expect that will be published probably sometime in 2019. So that's just kicking off. Uh, then uh, we have also got another activity going on uh, relating to fan extension, um, and this is technically an interest group, but it's actually working on advancing um, a project request. And it's to find uh, enhancements to the existing 15.4, what we call the sun phys. This is in 15.4G, enabling the support of high data rates. We still have to define what high means. And the support for long range, we still have to define what that means. So um, those activities, we expect that also to be improved in March. Uh, we need to nail this down a little bit more specifically, but uh, it's sort of building up the next case for uh, what's currently in the SunFi thing for smart metering, smart city applications. And lastly, we have been having uh, seven months worth now of an interest group activity, which is equivalent to an IETF BAF uh, on low power wide area. Uh, so that finished up actually in September. We, in terms of, and we reviewed the final report uh, in Orlando last week. Uh, and there was, uh, we have a process called the Wireless Next Generation Activity, and we uh, voted to establish a study group. And the mission of that study group uh, is uh, to develop a PAR and, you know, criteria, uh, CSD uh, for a potential 15.4 amendment. And this is uh, focusing on a very low payload bit rates. In other words, something less than 30 kilobits per second. Uh, in license exempt frequency bands and able to operate with significantly increased robustness in the presence of interference from other users in the band. Analyses presented in the LPWA interest group have shown that significant performance gains are possible. So um, that activity is just kicking off. Um, I think it's a pretty good probability uh, we'll be able to get a PAR written in January in uh, Newport Beach uh, and bring that into the March meeting as well. But that'll work specifically on a PHI um, that uh, is aimed at low bit rate, but very high performance uh, activity for 15.4. Yep, so um, Alexander again, just a short question on the new activities that are coming up and things that you'll be looking at in, in the, or starting to look at, do you feel that there are some things that we should consider for the new charter that, you know, new items that or new work that we should be thinking of like or at least start to to look at um uh, I'm, I'm my hearing has gotten really lousy so um what are you so uh, you, you're saying is there a possibility for this group to contribute to that or so so maybe i can i can rephrase the question and try to give an answer because i was participating to that uh uh, interest group at least for the past uh, year or so so uh, I guess the question that Alexander asked was is is there something this group should be considering during the recharter about this new work and, um, and possibly my, 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 possibly I think what you know will advance through the coordination group is um, I'll forward the par as soon as it's available uh, because I think it would be good um, to get input on that um, if that's in the January time frame, it literally means that you know maybe we can post that um, as a as a as a document, an LP WAN document, uh, in uh, in the January time frame, and get inputs on that uh, because otherwise it'll move pretty quickly after that. So if we can post that and maybe get comments uh, via the email list, uh, which I know you guys are very want to do. <laughs> So uh, that would be very helpful, uh, and uh, we can incorporate those in the March, uh, the March meeting, and then move that forward. Yeah. And uh, now, now I guess my my, my comment, uh, Juan Carlos, again from from participating in the group, most of the the, the results from the study pointed towards, uh, I would say, three main characteristics of this uh, potential amendment. One of them was start topology. The second one was frequency hopping, and the third one was forward error correction. Right, so I guess that from that point of view, uh, the impact would be not as significant at higher layers, like at Mac, uh, but still just just a heads up of what what the the potential part will show up. And I don't know if we, they already have a letter. Is it W or? Uh, I think uh, uh, January. Come to January. Okay. <laughs> 
I think it's a, that's what the study group kind of has to nail down. It all depends on how many. Uh, okay. Thank you. All right. I think that's the, the newsy news that, that might be of interest to this group. So thank you. So with this one, we would like to, to see if you have any other points that you would like to to discuss today? No, um, so we, we encourage people, since it's a result of this meeting, to uh, submit documents on uh, Chic Over Foo and Bar Over Chic now, that's the new thing. So uh, if, if you're interested in uh, applying uh, a certain flows over shake, it's cool to start working on a, on a bar over shake, and we'll see how this document uh, can be incorporated in the new charter work that we'll be doing. So that's one. And the second is we also encourage the authors of shake to look at all the errors that could happen so we can start working on a, a document for interior based on Juan Carlos suggestion. So that's that's a work that uh, we found today that we were missing. So it's a very good outcome of this meeting as well. Uh, yes, to, to these two points, yes. Uh, so uh, Karsten already, we saw, we, he already sent a, an email to the mailing list of, at CORE. So thank you very much, Karsten. So for setting up a registry of uh, co-op traffic that we could also look at. So this, this was basically the missing piece for continuing the the, the uh, chic over co-op oh yeah uh, chic the co-op chic uh, draft and uh, thank you very much Carson for this I think uh, this is a great start and we will set, be setting up the registry uh, as you suggested so that will be perfect and um, yeah thank you very much about this and uh, another point is that we were really happy with the hackathon during the past two ITFs. So it would be really good if um, on the next so on the next ITF we will be doing a hackathon. So be aware of this uh, from from now, and uh, we will be looking into having intraporal fragmentation, uh, like the, the full shake, the, the full the full package, right? Be there if you with your implementation of of, of shake with the compression and the fragmentation. Hopefully by that time we'll have some input on the shake over foo documents so and this will serve as an input for for the shake over foo uh, documents so and with this we we will uh, give you back uh, 20 minutes of your life or 10 minutes of your life so thank you very much all for attending this meeting uh, see you at the next interim we'll soon announce the the next series of interim meeting for lp1 and we'll see you in, where is next? London, London. Okay, bye-bye, thank you.